Welcome back to the Progressive Rehab and Strength Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Rory Alter, head clinical coach here at Progressive Rehab and Strength, with my lovely co-host for this month, Dr. Brianne Maruka. She's our uh, pelvic health specialist here at PRS. She's a clinical coach. She's a CrossFit coach, a strength training and barbell training coach. So she's all good things that integrate strength training and your pelvic health and all those good things. So what we're doing in this episode is we're talking about prolapse, pelvic Mm -hmm. organ prolapse, um, which is very common, but not normal. Not normal. Not normal. (laughs) You should not be experiencing this. And if you are experiencing prolapse, there's tons of things that you can do to address it non-surgically, non-pharmacologically, if that's the right word, um, and continue to train. So uh, yes. Bree, before we even explain what prolapse <laughs> is, because <clears throat> I'm sure people who have prolapse are like, I'm going to listen to this episode. Uh, but I'm sure there's people who don't have prolapse and might not even know what it is that are listening to this episode because they just want to learn from our podcast. So firstly, can, you know, everybody who knows what prolapse is knows that women get prolapse. Yes. However, can men get prolapse? Yes. Yes. Men can get prolapse. Now let's like actually back up even a little bit more to like a little quick anatomy lesson of mm-hmm. just like pelvic organs 101. Uh-huh. Um, because it's really important to know these because the names of prolapse and what's involved in prolapse is directly related to what organs are involved. So if we, we well, know what organs I think are involved, I think that's really important to note because not all prolapse is the same. Yes. There's multiple, uh, I guess, types of prolapse that Mm -hmm. you can experience. Um, and that kind of dictates maybe some of your symptoms, but truthfully in most, like in a general sense, it's not really changing the treatment as kind of, but not really in a general Mm -hmm. sense. So it all depends, right? It's kind of Um, like, it's kind of like when we look at back pain and we say, okay, this person has back pain, but we don't need to know if it's a bulging disc or a compressed nerve or stenosis, facet joint. We don't need to know because we're going to treat the symptoms and the root cause, like the the thing that's leading to whatever's compressing on the nerve. We're going to address that, not the nerve being compressed, if that makes sense. Yes, exactly. And, and yeah, so going to this, uh, pelvic anatomy, um, first, if we look at a pelvis and like our pelvic, again, a pelvis is like a bowl without a bottom and that bottom of the pelvis is covered by a sling of muscles called our pelvic floor muscles. And you can go back to our functional anatomy, um, podcast episode talking all about those muscles. Um, but specifically when we look then at what's inside the bowl, the pelvic bowl, um, let's start from the front. So we have our pubic bone in the front and you can feel that on yourself. You can press with your fingers, feel that bone in the front directly behind that pubic bone, um, is your bladder. And that's in men and women, your, your urinary bladder is right behind, um, sitting nicely behind that pubic bone. Um, which interestingly enough, we, I might mention this later a little bit, but that pubic bone, depending on your pelvic position can actually support the bladder a little bit. And, you know, so when we talk about form, I will get to there. Anyway, (laughs) I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm excited. Um, but we, so we have the pubic bone, the bladder next in line, we have the vagina or the vaginal canal. And on top of that vaginal canal are connected at, you know, that superior end of it, we have the uterus. Um, so it's basically the uterus connecting then from basically the door between the uterus and the vagina is the cervix. So when we hear about like cervical dilation and labor delivery, things like that. That is that door opening. Um, And then we have the vaginal canal, which is where prolapse, this is like where all the naming and everything comes into play. Um, Then we have directly behind that, the rectum or the large large intestine in the rectum. So just with that general anatomy, um, obviously men, we, they do not have a uterus and vagina, but that bladder and that rectum are in the, pro- then they have the prostate. Um, but generally those, you know, instead of the vagina and the uterus men have that prostate, um, in between. So in general, again, um, when we, so, so now that you have a good little 101 pelvic anatomy, pelvic organ anatomy uh, lesson, let's get into naming these types of prolapse. So every type of prolapse, except 
rectal prolapse specifically is named based on what organ is pressing into the vaginal canal. So cystocele, that is the bladder pressing into the vaginal canal. Now, even let me back up a quick second here. Nothing um, other than if we have uterine prolapse and very, very, very severe uterine prolapse, do we have something physically coming out of the vagina in the sense of like your organs are falling out of you in, in that sense? So let me clarify that again, cystocele is the bladder pressing into the vaginal wall. And if you experience symptoms or visibly can touch or feel or see the something coming out of that opening, it's the vaginal wall you're, you're seeing. It's not the actual bladder. So, uh, so first cystocele bladder dropping into the vagina. Next, we can have, um, uterine prolapse, which is just what I mentioned. That's where the uterus drops straight down. Um, and if it's severe enough, which again, most cases, if you're feeling something there, it's, it's not so usually that that's a very severe, severe case of, of uterine prolapses. If you're actually having that, um, uterus and that cervix, you know, visibly being seen out of the vaginal opening. Um, then we have enterocele, which is part of the small intestine bulging into the vaginal canal. So that's, you know, kind of it's slipping part of the small intestine slipping down between the vagina and the large intestine. And then we have rectocele, which is the large intestine or the rectum bulging into that vaginal canal. In men specifically, they don't, you don't get the name of having cystocele or enterocele or rectocele per se, because you don't have a vagina. However, you can get those organs. If you're having pressure mismanagement and laxity in those tissues, you can have those organs kind of pressing down into the pelvic floor. Um, not necessarily that you're experiencing the typical prolapse symptoms of a bulge or dryness or itchiness or irritation because nothing's kind of coming out of a vaginal opening. She don't have that opening. Um, but you can feel that sensation of pressure, heaviness, discomfort, pain um, in that pelvic floor region. If those organs are being pressed down into that area. So, um, but with men specifically, what they experience more so is rectal prolapse, which mm -hmm. is the actual uh, rectum coming out of like the large intestine coming out of the rectum. Mm. Um, and you can get like a bulge there. So the, that's a lot of words and a lot of not the, don't, don't get too hung up on like, Oh, do I have specifically, right. uh, still, you know, whatever. Again, does it really matter? I mean, rectocele or sorry, rectal prolapse um, is usually treated a little differently than the other prolapse that like female experience with the cystocele, uterine and enterocele and rectocele. Um, but otherwise it's the, the essence of it all is comes down to, and I hate to say this, but pressure management, intercourse stability. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. yeah. So can you talk a little bit about what the typical symptoms are uh, of female prolapse and then the typical, oh, no, I, not female, because female can have rectal prolapse, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So what are, what are the typical symptoms of the vaginal prolapse yeah. and the typical symptoms of the rectal prolapse? Perfect. So yeah. So vaginal <laughs> prolapse, what I commonly hear is heaviness or pressure down in the pelvic or vaginal area um, or in the rectal area, especially after training, especially at the end of the day, if you're on your feet or just by the end of the day, it's like, oh, I just feel sore or achy or pressure, heaviness, any of those descriptors. Um, also, a lot of uh, women experience dry, scratching, itching, almost feels irritating in that vaginal area. Like you have like just it just it feels dry and itchy down there um in like no, the it's vaginal so funny area because you know I'm always gonna pull in my own little experiences yeah. I don't I don't have prolapse but I had during pregnancy women can experience symptoms of prolapse with all the moving and changing and growing yes. but postpartum you know I'm fine um, but I just remember, you know, cause you and I, we talked about some of the heavy, like I was, I didn't know what I was experiencing because I, I thought maybe it was prolapse, but I was not sure. So I spoke to you about it. Um, and what it felt like to me was it, women will understand this way better than men, what I'm describing, but there's different 
thong thickness is. You know, you can have yeah. like a, a string <laughs> or you can have wrong, like a thi- you can have like a thick thong, you know, whatever. It can yeah. be like an inch wide, it could be half an inch, it could be like a centimeter, whatever. A little string. A little <laughs> string, right. Okay. So what it would feel like to me was that I had like an inch thong, but it was like bunched up into my vagina. Yeah. And it just felt like I couldn't get my, un- get my underwear <laughs> out of there. And I was like, what is this? Yeah. Ew. <laughs> I was like, what's going on? <laughs> Especially and- too, at that point, you may have like, and TMI maybe, but you may have not even been wearing a thong. You may have been wearing right. normal underwear. Right. Exactly. Pregnancy. Yeah. So you're and like, oh. <laughs> yeah. I just like, I just couldn't like, I couldn't adjust anything. Like. Couldn't get it. Couldn't. And there's like other things that I'm not even going to mention that women yeah. know. But like, you know, men adjust themselves all the time. Like women have to adjust themselves sometimes. It just felt like I had to adjust myself and like nothing I did was like getting that sensation away. And yeah. um, but it wasn't it wasn't super intense. I only had it like on like you said, when I was tired, when I was on my feet all day, if I had trained I didn't get enough sleep that's when I was experiencing those symptoms when I was when my muscles were just checking out you know yeah which Um, that brings up a really good point of you know I will keep talking about the again inner core and core mm -hmm. stability and fatigue and training fatigue and programming and all that good stuff but you'll notice that we keep mentioning this because that is the again, foundation of the, of many of these symptoms and these diagnoses that we get. Um, so it's just, it's just interesting that yes, like these symptoms correlate with fatigue and training and, you know, anyway. And, and just to kind of just follow up a little bit on that. Um, Mm -hmm. one of the reasons we don't necessarily recommend that people do direct isolated core work when they are doing barbell training, the squat, bench, deadlift, overhead presses, because we don't want to over fatigue our core muscles. Yes. And even the complex case that, you know, if you listen to our first episode together with Bree during the functional anatomy episode, I mentioned that I had presented a complex case at um, CSM. And this was an incontinence, not a prolapse case, but one of the things that she was doing was like direct isolated core warm-ups and like like too many things before she started training that were fatiguing her pre-fatiguing the system pre-fatiguing the system and so then she was so i was like listen you got to take that out of your warm-up like don't do that you're too tired by the time you get to your lifts and we pulled that out we changed her belt like all these things but all these things apply not just to incontinence but to prolapse belt pre-fatigue so we'll get into all that dr but, all of it i mean yeah. it's yeah it's very um, interesting so but you know another like i think another sensation we're, we're just to kind of go back to what this yeah the sensations or symptoms are it's also sometimes like when you put in a tampon but you don't get it in all the way you know like dry, stuck or yeah, there like, or oh, coming out a dry, little bit stuck like not in all the way too close yeah. to the surface that kind of thing um so yeah some other descriptors are like even feeling like there's a golf ball in your vagina. I, I mean, not that most of us know what that <laughs> probably feels like, but like you can imagine that like it just feels like this something, a ball is in there and it just is like, just feels funky. Um, obviously with uh, when it comes to other symptoms related to other, outside of those like direct prolapsy type of descriptors, um, you might also experience, which is very common, um, is not feeling like you're fully emptying your bladder or having to stand up and then you like post void dribbling is what we call it. So you stand up and then a little bit of urine leaks out, you know, comes out then, or you have to stand up, sit back down and then finish emptying your bladder. Cause that changes the position of the bladder and urethra mm-hmm. to kind of unkink the hose in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, also too, with like, if you're having more rec- uh, rectocil involvement, um, I know for me, and again, we talk, gosh, we get so personal with all this stuff. I know where like, we're going with this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so for me, and this is, this is a very long story short. This we're not going to crazy. Into detail. <laughs> so I have like trauma, like I have like PTSD from it. So, but like I had a, um, jet ski incident when I was in high school where I had felt like it went off the back of a jet ski and the jet went straight to my rectum. And I've had rectocele that from since then, um, and I know for me, like bowel movements, like I notice you might have to splint with bowel movements, which just means that maybe apply some pressure to help 
support that rectal area that's bulging um, to kind of fully empty your bowels. You might feel like you don't fully empty your bowels. You might get constipation. That hello, I've, I've <laughs> been a long uh, chronic. Now my bowels are going really great, but. <laughs> in case you guys wanted to know. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, sorry. I mean, so I just as an aside, is a just too. as an aside, um, women or not just women, pelvic mm-hmm. health specialists or people who deal with the sensitive region um, in both men and women are very, very open about their own experiences because we understand how sensitive it is. Mm-hmm. And we want you guys to know that you're not alone. You're not alone. You're not yeah, the, like you're like, not alone. It's like we understand like you do not have to be fearful of sharing this stuff with your pelvic health specialist, mm-hmm. your doctor, whatever, because there are we're human. <laughs> we're human. It's super common. And like, yeah. like who like that is such a traumatic event. Who, who, yeah. who would like, would you ever think that someone would have a jet ski blow up there? <laughs> I mean, like, honestly. come on. Okay. I'm going to be this. We're going to get like memes or like thing. I'm just, okay. Guys, no, I think mean, this is educational. Please. You no, know. it's yeah. Oh gosh. I hope no one makes any memes out of this, but, um, Please don't, guys, because, yeah. well, honestly, if people are making memes out of this, it just goes to show that people are embarrassed to talk about this, yes. you know, and um, we just want you to know that we've experienced it, mm-hmm. and that's why we're so passionate about helping people, because you can lead a full life yes. without this stuff interfering with your training, your social life, your sex life, your yeah. relationships. Um you know, and it does interfere when it's not managed well, it does interfere Correct. with those things. Um, so we're just sharing so that you guys feel comfortable seeking help, whether it's from us or your doctor or another uh, pelvic health specialist. Like mm-hmm. there's people that you can talk to. You're not alone and you should not have to deal with these things. So anyway. And, and we're not <laughs> perfect either. Like, again, we are human. So like just, yeah just know that we we're not sitting here trying to lecture you and say, Oh, in the perfect world or by the book or by that's mm-hmm. again, why we are, we're doing this is because yeah, we've experienced this and we had to troubleshoot and we've, you know, anyway, so please like, yeah. yeah. Okay. So back anyway. to rectocele. <laughs> yes. So you can, yeah, back to the beginning. Um, so yeah. So like, splinting with bowel movements, um, not fully emptying bowel, your bowels or feeling like you're fully emptying. Um, constipation is a huge, uh, and, and, and on top of that straining with bowel movements, feeling like you really have to push and strain, um, with those. So and pain, of course, with, with bowel movements can be um, part of that as well. Um, and Rory, exactly what you said too, with intimacy, um, especially with women, definitely feeling like dry. There's something in the way, um, just feeling things, just feeling really congested. Um, just, and, and again, I know this might not be the most like beautiful term to use, but like a lot of women will say like, it feels very tight and just mm-hmm. oh, like, just, it, it's not comfortable. Um, or you might even notice some leaking during intimacy or, you know, cause you're pushing on the bladder. So if, mm-hmm. if that's involved, yeah, so. if the, if the bla- <laughs> yeah, if the bladder is encroaching on the vagina and then something's inserted into the vagina, it could cause, it causes pressure on the bladder, mm-hmm. which then can cause some opening and leaking. Yep. So I would say those are the main, like vaginal related prolapse symptoms, um, with rectal prolapse, which is, is honestly much more uncommon. Like I, Mm -hmm. for the many, 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 uh, men and women that I've worked with that have experienced prolapse or have had symptoms of prolapse or been diagnosed with prolapse, rectal prolapse. I think I've, I could probably count on one hand, mm-hmm. um, cause it's not the most, not the most common, um, mm-hmm. but it does happen. And usually it's, it's more painful. Um, you do notice more of like a bulging outside mm-hmm. of the rectum. Um, and it's not just like hemorrhoid bulging where you have these little like beads, like hemorrhoids mm-hmm. are kind of more beads that mm-hmm. if you would, will, uh, coming out of the rectum, but this is more of like, whoa, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not something that hemorrhoids kind of come and go and they ebb and flow and they're not so severe. Usually that rectal prolapse is like a bit much more severe, Mm -hmm. like pain. I got to take care of this. Like what's going on Mm -hmm. type of, Mm -hmm. you know, so. Mm -hmm. Um, um, What are the typical causes? Like why do people get prolapse? Because 
I know that, you know, there can be so many different reasons, you know, in a young individual like you, it was something traumatic, you mm-hmm. know, um, but as we get older, we can experience it during pregnancy and then it can resolve on its own. So mm-hmm. um, what are some of the reasons that prolapse develops? I would say the most common and generalized reason is that fatigue inner core, I don't even want to say instability, but just that system not doing the best job that it can. So pressure mm-hmm. mismanagement, I would say, so let's, yeah, let's say that, let's say fatigue and pressure mismanagement. And for mm-hmm. whatever reason that might be, mm-hmm. um, that I think is usually the foundation of most, if not all prolapse. And then even if that's not the foundation or the key point of your cause of your prolapse, it's usually involved because most people that I see after a prolapse surgery, um, have still have pelvic floor dysfunction and inner core dysfunction afterwards that they still experience some of those prolapse symptoms, even after if they would get surgery, cause that's not addressing the root cause. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So it's not like a weakness. It's more like a maladaptive motor connection of the core and causing pressure to then yeah. push so, to that. Like we talked yeah. about in the functional anatomy episode and the Valsalva episode that our core functions automatically. Like we don't even mm-hmm. have to think. Like it should naturally function in a specific way to support our spine, our organs, and maintain everything, but also create that intra abdominal and intra thoracic pressure, um, which creates this stability in the pelvic floor so all those organs kind of stay in place but if you're bracing incorrectly for what if you develop this maladaptive bracing pattern for whatever reason and then you get pressured downward on the pelvic floor that's going to create like a fatigue or pressure mismanagement issue that you can no longer contain and then um, over time it kind of just stretches things out if does that make sense is that kind of what's happening yeah. So a good, kind, well, it's like kind of an okay visual, but probably one of the best <laughs> visuals I can like the, you know, and it's very commonly used is like, think of a boat mm-hmm. that is um, tied to a dock. Mm-hmm. So the, the water under the boat, think of more like your pelvic floor muscles. Think of the ties to the dock as like your ligaments, t- you know, your mm-hmm. organ, your pelvic connective tissue, ligament, mm-hmm. or what did I just say? Pelvic connective tissue, mm-hmm. um, ligaments, And then think of the boat as like whatever organ you're thinking Mm -hmm. of. So, um, so think of if you're, say you have more of a muscular, muscular pressure management problem, that's thinking of the water dropping. Mm -hmm. Those ties are going to get pulled and stressed Mm -hmm. and strained. Mm -hmm. And eventually Mm -hmm. they're either going, I mean, they're going to stretch or lengthen or, you know, Mm -hmm. be stressed. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you can get that boat dropping down Mm -hmm. or the organ Mm -hmm. kind of dropping down. Um, If you have more of a problem with the ties, um, even if that water is there, you're going to get a lot more movement of Mm -hmm, those organs. mm -hmm. Um, Or again, you can have a combination of both. So the boat's going to float away. (laughs) Yeah. So just, I mean, and and, okay, we we only have so much room in our body for our our (laughs) organs to like move and organs are meant to move. So like, that's something that like, you know, our organs are meant to have give and take and uh, flexibility and are able to move. But again, there is a point that, okay, that, the, that support system is meant to do its job as well. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, again, it doesn't really matter if like, oh, your organs ha- or your, you know, support connective tissue has this much tension in it, or like, it's just functionally speaking, we're looking at this system as a whole. And I've had women that, you know, especially that have came to me with like prolapse symptoms where you could visibly see palpate, you know, assess that say cystocele, you know, you could see that external, a little bit externally and just working on that pressure management system and the inner core, those, that visible, um, position of that organ was kind of resolved or I, we weren't able, unless they were super fatigued, they noticed symptoms maybe, but like, other than that, it was very well managed. So <laughs> yeah. just interesting how much, even if you have that kind of, I don't want to say laxity in that tissue, whether that's pregnancy or whether that's a trauma or whether even or for myself, related. again, yeah, age related atrophy, you know, mm-hmm. it's saying again, even for me, like a traumatic, you know, where the, the tissue went it's beyond damaged. its, yeah. yeah, went to beyond its limits that you can still manage 
those symptoms and manage not putting extra pressure to exacerbate Mm -hmm. that, that path of least resistance per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, we, we talk about, I mean, I don't know how much we talk about it, but we hear everybody else talk about it. Um, but there's just general age related changes in our, in our Mm -hmm. collagen, in our connective tissue, in our muscles, you know, we, we basically are fighting muscle loss as we get older right and breakdown of like yeah tissue. and and collagen breakdown you know we see people dye their hair because it turns gray we see people get botox and fillers and facelifts because their skin becomes wrinkled and their cha- their face changes and you know we said this in our functional anatomy episode we can't see our inside mm-hmm. you know so we can see all these age related changes on the outside that we address and manage with things you know Um, We can do preventative things, obviously, like we can't prevent our hair from turning gray, but um, we can keep our hair as healthy as possible as, and we can eat as well as possible and Mm. we can exercise and we can use skincare products, like wash our face and get facials and do all these things Mm -hmm. to help stress management, (laughs) stress management and slow the process of aging or, or maintain our our youthfulness as much as possible and the way that we do that with our muscles is and our and our bones and our tendons and our Mm -hmm. ligaments is resistance training yeah right stressing them appropriately we must yeah the way that we keep our bones strong and dense and build more density and strengthen our bones is resistance training the way that we keep our muscles tendons ligaments collagen Mm -hmm. like connective tissue strong is resistance training right and so maybe you didn't do any of that as you age okay so you start to lose collagen you start to lose muscle mass you start to you know get weaker and all these that things. coordination gets yeah our, our neuromuscular system is not as sharp and that's when we start to get that's the age-related yeah. changes to the pelvic um the pelvic floor um and the inner core and that's kind of how we just get general age-related um prolapse right mm-hmm. you know and or pelvic floor dysfunction um so um, what are some typical treatments for prolapse so, outside uh, outside of pressure management and resistance training? Yes, programming, all that good stuff. Um, so first off, a lot of individuals will kind of self-manage. So they'll mm-hmm. just avoid doing mm-hmm. things that kind of flare up or exacerbate mm-hmm. or, or uh, because an onset of those symptoms, which obviously, you know, that's not that's just kind of avoiding i don't really want to say that that's like a treatment per se but it's just like avoiding you know um but with that um some other self-management things i've i hear is actually women using like tampons um or using things which i let's talk about a better beyond again working at that root cause of retraining or you know training that inner core system and pressure management if you still need support after that, because those ties of the boat are mm-hmm. kind of, you know, they, they, that's just what the, yeah, <laughs> that's just what the tissue is. Um, if you need a little bit of extra support, a pessary is very commonly used to help support that tissue from the inside. So basically pessaries come in a lot of different shapes, sizes. Um, but generally speaking, you, the most common one, I guess you could say is like a disc that you mm-hmm. fold up like a taco, insert into the uh, vaginal canal, and then it opens up almost like a trampoline mm-hmm. to just give, actually think of it more like if you have a circus tent and a circus tent and you put the hole in the middle of the tent, like it from the bottom, it supports mm-hmm. the top of the mm-hmm. tent. So that's kind of what the pessary is doing. Um, and it just gives you that support. Now, pessaries you go to like your uh, doctor's office, usually fitted by a physician assistant or the doctor, um, and they can be left in for longer periods of time, changed every week, changed. You can go to the office. They can change them for you if that's something you're not comfortable with. Um, but they are meant to, the quality of the material used are meant to stay in, you know, you can leave it in for longer periods of time. Much safer than yes. a tampon, which can lead to toxic toxic shock syndrome if you leave it in for more than a period of time 
Yes. And also tampons aren't meant to be in like internal, just sitting there, not during like your menstrual cycle. They're mm-hmm. not meant to that dryness, that material that mm-hmm. it just, and here's the thing, the string coming out, you, if you pee or you poop and that touches either front or back that sanitary wise, we don't want all of those, that bacteria or those germs and things going up into the vagina um so sanitary wise i would that's another that <laughs> way to describe how prolapse feels is when that string from the tampon is just super irritating and it's there <laughs> it's there anyway okay anyway a side yes. note if you're wondering <laughs> yeah no that and that is that is definitely a way to describe it too um but i would say again and that's so so we have pessaries um that are very common then we also have surgeries, which I think are kind of the most go-to common surgery and like medication, which the medications don't really address prolapse. If anything, they just try, attempt, try and attempt to address your symptoms of urinary symptoms mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. dryness. Like we'll get, like I, I've had so many women that have had pro- diagnosed with prolapse and one of their main symptoms is dryness and they're uh, prescribed vaginal estrogen cream. And I'm just like, honestly, like, I mean, I don't know, could that be helping for some reason? Maybe I like, maybe, but it's, it's interesting that they use it and use it, use it and don't see any difference. And then we work on those muscles and work on posture and positioning and different things. And it's like, oh, that's Mm -hmm. better now. Like Mm -hmm. I I get it. So, I mean, okay. So, you know, pharmacologically speaking, you know, there are things to help address the symptoms, but there, I don't know of anything that would treat prolapse in your tissue to uh, to correct a prolapse um, diagnosis or you know symptoms Mm -hmm. Um, then we have surgery which can be a sling or hysterectomy most commonly so a sling is usually involving some sort of mesh or uh, material that is used to help kind of more permanently attempt to bring back that support that maybe you know, we've lost through aging or traumas or, you know, stretching that tissue and whatever Mm -hmm. reasons. Hysterectomy is kind of just taking it all out and saying, Mm -hmm. well, if you don't have a bladder or or, sorry, not a bladder, (laughs) you don't have, (laughs) dear God, (laughs) that'd cause a lot more problems. If you don't have a uterus, it can't drop and prolapse down into your vagina. So let's just get rid of it. But again, a lot of women, especially because again, hysterectomies are, are female, um, prolapse related. Mm -hmm. I I can't tell you, I would say most, I mean, obviously I don't see, I wouldn't see the women in the clinic that don't, you know, that their symptoms resolve, but Mm -hmm. I've seen so, so many, um, cases where you get a sling, get a hysterectomy and it's like, my symptoms were better for like a few weeks and then they're way worse now, or they, they're still the same or, you know, have not improved. So I had a client who had surgery for incontinence so she had a sling put in yeah or some whatever some type of mesh and she had urinary retention after that mm-hmm. i think we that's a i think very she had common i too. think she met with you i can't remember um but she ended up needing catheterization and mm-hmm. a, i think she had a second surgery to remove it probably uh, which i don't even know it was terrible yeah. she didn't we didn't work together on that specifically, she and I, but I just remember when she went through that. And, you know, mm-hmm. some, I seriously try and urge my clients to speak to you before they do any type of treatment like that. Because, like exhaust the other yes. non-invasive options. Exactly. And we do this with orthopedic injuries as well, orthopedic yeah. injuries and pain as well. We want to do like as conservative as possible because there's just so many issues that can happen related to surgery. And also if you're just treating the the tissue and not the issue, I say this all the time, we have to treat the issue, not the tissue, because if you just treat the tissue and the issue is still there, it's just going to happen to the tissue again, you know? Yes. And this is what you're talking about. You know, these people come to you after their surgery and they're, still having their symptoms and there's nothing wrong like okay you obviously we're biased because we are movement and muscle and you know muscle experts movement experts so we yes we're biased because we see the we see how how what we do makes 
the great, like such great changes in people's symptoms and people's symptom management in their prevention, in their overall health and wellness. So like, yes, we're biased and we're not sitting here saying that, oh, surgery is awful. Don't get it. Oh, farm, you know, pharmacological intervention is awful. Don't do it. But when you're talking about something that has no real side effects, that's not really in invasive per se. And it's like, it either works or it doesn't, it either helps you or it doesn't. Why not exhaust all of that when again, for most cases, that's the root cause anyway. Mm -hmm. And if you can address that, you know, and again, then that will help prevent further worsening or exacerbation in the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, why not? Yeah. I don't know. So yeah, surgery is not, I mean, some people need it. There are cases that surgery is absolutely necessary or, you know, medical, more medical intervention is necessary and that's okay. But yeah, I just, there's it, more to, there's more. It just, <laughs> it just, it upsets me so much because when we know that the root cause of the changes in the tissue in the pelvic floor are because of misuse. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is a like lot. <laughs> muscle loss and all that. And then you go and have a surgery, which is invasive. You have to rest after it. So it interrupts the tissue. Um, it interrupts the neurological the system. Yeah, yeah. It's, and, you know, and this is something that's already that that's the cause. And then you go in and like the interruption is the problem. And then you go and interrupt it more and you cause yes. like a need more dysfunction to, or more, more dysfunction because you have to rest. Your body isn't going to work as optimally as it could, yes. even with your dysfunction now it's working less optimally because you just had mm. surgery and there's all this rest and atrophy and and you know we say move it or lose it and we always want to like splint or immobilize last because mm -hmm. when you cause when you have to not yeah. when you have to not use something then there's more loss and more neurological, more motor motor changes to that area, n more neuromuscular interference to that area. And then we have to undo all of that stuff after, you know? So we're kind of, it like almost perpetuates the problem more when we could have just tried that in the first place. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh. Yeah. And exactly. <laughs> I would say like, again, anything more invasive, I would say like, that I personally, if I were in the position of like, not a, not, I don't know, just considering surgery, and I would exhaust anything I could first. And then, Hey, if I still need this, like, I, okay, like there's just a point where that's okay. Like if that's what I need, that's what I need. I get it. Um, but again, that think of consider the fact that when we're doing more invasive, uh, interventions, you can add on then scar tissue again, basically you're again, what mm -hmm. you've already kind of described, but there, we don't just get the surgery and it's like, boop, our, our, the problems fixed or oop, our medication fixes. It. It's like, well, there's side effects to these things. Mm -hmm. There's other things then we have mm -hmm. to address, which if, if needed, okay, no problem. But yeah, yeah. let's exhaust the conservative options mm -hmm. first. So, um, in terms of the rectal prolapse, which we know already is not as common. Mm -hmm. um, well, do men get these like pelf these like sling surgeries? Do they get it? Not, not on, not really. No. So because typically, how is is prolapse addressed in men? To be honest, and I don't want to say sit here and be like I don't know, but like <laughs> I, I know. I mean, it, I, what I mean by that is like they don't first come off, to you for PT. Yes, first off, they don't come to me like. Pelvic pain is, I would say, one of the most common reasons mm -hmm. that, that we see, or, or like, I would say pelvic pain, definitely number one, erectile or penile pain, uh, erectile dysfunction, like those types of more related things, number two. Um, and then I have had where actually I have two patients in particular that I can, that off the top of my head that had rectal surgery. One was not now that we look back and like go back through all of the PT we did and like mm -hmm. looking at the, the histories of, ooh, we both kind of agreed that like, yeah, that was probably not the problem and not the solution to the problem, but, and it caused a lot of other problems, but had rectal surgery. Um, but I had two patients that have had rectal surgery more related to, and they were related to rectal prolapse mm -hmm. symptoms ish. Mm -hmm. 
And I would say that like for men, one, they don't come to see me. They're not even uh, prescribed. Referred. Yeah. yeah. Referred to come to see me anyway for most of these things. Then if they, I've had actually had, I could also can remember a patient that like a male walked in and he was like, what? This nah. is what, this is what my doctor. Okay. I'm, I'm not staying. Like they were just oh, like, I don't so sad. Yeah. I don't, I don't care if it helps. I don't care. Like what I, this is just really uncomfortable. And like, I get it. Um, but if that's going to help your symptoms, like I, and help your body and help support anyway. Um, but yeah, so rectal prolapse usually, um, needs surgical intervention. That is mm-hmm. a case where, you know, that's, that's more of that intervention. Um, I would say that, the other prolapses, whether you're experiencing, again, if you're a man and you're experiencing the pelvic pressure, heaviness, um, pain, that's just, if, if you do come, you know, get to see a pelvic floor specialist, it's usually just working on that inner core. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause they don't really have that opening of like a path that right. such a path of least resistance. Least resistance it's like an yeah. opening in the, in the, I feel like, I mean, obviously like I don't work in the clinic mm-hmm. like you do, but I feel like that would be misdiagnosed in a lot of men as mm. like prostate issues yes. or you know gas or constipation or something like that and so i think this for for this conversation you know if you're listening to this and you're a male who's experiencing any of those symptoms and the doctor's like it's your prostate and gives you medication for your prostate and it's not helping or you know you're taking you know stool softeners or you you have you know medication for ED or whatever, and you're still Mm -hmm. having those symptoms, see a pelvic floor specialist Mm -hmm. because you could be experiencing pressure mismanagement and just some education. Yeah. And just as as enlarged prostate. Exactly. That actually, and I don't have the research and I don't have like, again, Mm -hmm. there, I don't have enough male patients that have come, have been uh, referred for these symptoms to like, t- for me to say, Oh, it's everyone that has prostate, you know, and enlar- or diagnosed mm-hmm. with prostate enlargement actually has pelvic cord dysfunction. Like, I don't know that. And I can't say that, but I would be very curious. And I would bet to say that most men diagnosed with an enlarged prostate and get pharmacological, you know, flow max and these, mm-hmm. these different types of medications to improve their flow of urine actually have more of a pelvic floor inner floor inner core dysfunction that is causing the bladder symptoms that they're not they have a hard time starting and stopping the flow Mm -hmm. of their urine or Mm -hmm. fully emptying their bladder or Mm -hmm. have severe urgency like those symptoms don't tell me as much of an enlarged prostate as much as it would pelvic floor dysfunction Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so and even i would you know and this is kind of what we when we mentioned in the in our functional anatomy how we kind of have these like aha moments when we're talking mm-hmm. like I feel like we're having an aha moment yes. right now <laughs> you know I'm just thinking you know even you know maybe you do have an enlarged prostate and that is something that's developing as yeah. that develops your the position of your muscles the length tension rela- relationship yes. your muscles in your pelvic floor are going to change and we you know sometimes then have maladaptive neuromuscular responses yeah. to that um and that can lead to those pelvic floor symptoms so yes. you know working even if you do have the enlarged prostate you know still addressing the inner pelvic floor yes. is really important and can probably help you a little bit more than taking medications that ultimately have side effects too you know yes. so um Anyway, <laughs> that was a good aha moment. Uh, Honestly, I, I really, yeah, <laughs> uh, love it. <clears throat> okay, mm-hmm. um, so let's go into talking about training with prolapse. Yes. So whenever, so whenever you have symptoms of prolapse, that tells me that we need to probably address the system in some way. So, yes we definitely want to look at your programming and fatigue. Yes. We definitely want to look at your form. I mean, of course your equipment, like those things are huge components of training, of course, with prolapse, but also addressing your symptoms. Um, but like that tells me that you, there is a, probably a pressure mismanagement issue. And that tells me that that inner core system is not compacting in that Valsalva. You're not bracing and compacting and creating that stability and managing pressure the way that it should. Um, 
And again, as coaches, we problem solve and say, okay, is this only happening with heavy sets? Is this only mm. happening? Is this happening with all of your warm up sets and working sets? So, like, that is why it's so, so important to have a coach that understands both aspects and can say, like, let's, let's problem solve, not just give you a blanket, like, mm-hmm. okay, we're only going to train you at light weights now, like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, or something like right. that. Because so, you should, even if you have any of these pelvic dis pelvic floor or just inner core dysfunctions that we're talking about um, or injuries or mm-hmm. symptoms or diagnoses, you should be able to train at high capacity or perform. Okay. I want the difference between performance and train because you can go into a competition and perform a 1RM, you know, mm-hmm. and not have symptoms. But if you're training at 1RM loads all the time or our RM loads all the time, you might develop symptoms, right? So it's looking at. And how- vice versa too. If yeah. you're training at more sub like lower loads and then you go and perform at like a one rep max, that's like, wait, you weren't prepared for like, right. you can it's, have symptoms on the right. platform, but not in training. Right. So when we talk about training with these dysfunctions or these disorders, we have to find the balance between training capacity and inner core stability. Mm. Does that make sense? And pressure management. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. So with training then, so of course we look at, again, how we already mentioned the equipment we look at, you know, is your, is, are your prolapse symptoms not really a problem in and of the system, but is it more so where your belt might not be fitting correctly and it's pushing into the bladder and it's really adding extra pressure we don't need there. Or again, fatigue, whatever we, we kind of, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but, Mm -hmm. um, but with training, we definitely want to, and just like anything we talk about orthopedically or, you know, neurologically, like we want to meet our body where it's at and then progress from there. So what I would say is, yes, we want to address that re-coordination if we need to, um, not everyone needs to, but readdress or address, um, reteaching a proper Valsalva, um, when to breathe, you know, with your lift, when to, you know, all of that. Um, but then we also want to, you know, be progressively overloading in a, an appropriate way that those tissues can adapt, but we're, and, and be stressed, but we're not inducing unnecessary fatigue. And of course, too, managing, and this is something I always talk about, like when we talk, when I work with rehab coaching clients is like, we truly start with like, okay, we train or sorry, we are living our day most hours of the day. And we only train a portion of our day some days, not every day. So what are we doing outside of training that could support again, Mm -hmm. posture, our habits, how we Mm -hmm. work, what we do with stress, et cetera. So like also addressing that, even if your symptoms are only in training, we want to be also taking a peek at what Mm -hmm. we're doing outside of training Mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think just kind of touching on that idea of are your symptoms present during training only um, or are they present in training and outside of training? So mm-hmm. if if you're – and I think this kind of goes to like one of the questions that I have to discuss with you about um, when should someone see a pelvic health specialist to address the prolapse very specifically versus address it from a training perspective? And I think the answer to that – and correct me if I'm wrong, is Mm -hmm. if you have symptoms that are outside of training, you've got to see a pelvic health specialist and address those symptoms because it's not a training-related prolapse. Yes, and that only is like maybe stressing the system worse, but in your normal everyday function, it's your body's, that system's not doing what it's meant to do, so yes. But, But also, even if you have symptoms outside of training, that doesn't mean that you can't train. Yes. It means that we have to address training so that it doesn't exacerbate your symptoms, right? Yes. And two, I would say, um, if you're only experiencing uh, symptoms in training, what I would say is to see a pelvic health specialist, a, a, I would say the time you would probably want to is one, if you're experiencing it with any loads, like really light warm up lo- mm-hmm. loads, really, you know, cause that's, that's still kind of just an extension of, okay, maybe your everyday living mm-hmm. isn't but, but a tiny bit of stress is, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, causing those symptoms. But then also too, if you're really having a hard time, like understanding, okay, like 
maybe you're bracing or valsalving incorrectly and you cannot for the life of you like figure out like like you just and, and it does it feels like like you're a baby deer like how mm-hmm. how do I do this but like, this also is, the problem the problem is is that not every physical therapist not just uh, public yes. health physical therapist understands what a valsalva is and they yes. might think that a valsalva is dangerous and going to and not to do it exactly and if they're telling you them if they're telling you that then they're not the right physical therapist to see because we Valsalva all the time in daily life automatically. So oh. book a call with Bree. <laughs> <laughs> well, and let me point this out too, because this is something we've had many, many, many conversations about. A lot of things we see online, um, on Instagram, on where they're like, you have to exhale. And and this is a maybe another conversation for another day, but your core can and, and naturally does function. I call like a dynamic or a working brace or a working breath. Mm-hmm. So, so don't get me wrong. Like Valsalva is not the only way the core can function mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. appropriately. Like there is a, there is a time and a place for the core to be contracting and relaxing, but staying at like a, a higher rest or higher working oh, contraction yeah, yeah. while you're breathing. Like, so, so think of like cardio, like you can't run in like hold your breath the whole time. You also can't like, like, like contract, relax, like with all every breath. So there is a point. And and again, that gets a little more complicated and harder to explain just verbally. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But so there is that time and place, but for someone to blanketly tell you, say you have to exhale on the hard part and then inhale on the easy part. And when you're pregnant, you have to, Mm -hmm. you don't want to increase, you don't want to Valsalva because that's wrong or that's Mm -hmm. bad or you have this, these symptoms, you have prolapse, you, you have to exhale or mm-hmm. a common um, saying that I hear that I've, I've actually like through my training have like, I've been taught was like blow before you go. Mm-hmm. Like you always have to exhale before and while you're doing something. It's like, hmm. sometimes yes, but no, but most times no, but to yeah, reach, I mean, it yeah. really, I mean a lot, we, you know, we say it all the time. It depends. Um, mm-hmm. And that's why, we don't give blanket statements because it does really depend on who you are, what your history is, what your symptoms are, what Mm -hmm. you've tried so far, how your symptoms present, um, what the cause is, all those things. So, but to just for someone to say that you should never Valsalva if you have a prolapse or you have incontinence, that's not the right person for you Mm -hmm. to see because, or you're pregnant or you, yeah, there's, and there's, women's health certification or women's women like i'm not even gonna coach certification coach certifications like you and i have talked about this many times there's people out there on instagram we don't like (laughs) um but we don't like them we don't know them like that's we don't know them but we don't like what's frustrating it's frustrating it's just frustrating to see people providing certifications that are actually teaching incorrect things and can actually again, reduce your stability and mm-hmm. cause and, and lead to, uh, just pain in the back could lead to uh, pressure mismanagement in the pelvic floor and, and cause be almost like a cause of these mm-hmm. problems. So mm-hmm. like, it's, oh, it's just sad and it's frustrating. Yeah. So let's kind of just sum up in terms of training. I honestly want to refer people to our pain and injury series because we really treat the pelvic floor symptoms when they're more training related than outside of training. We treat them like any other injury in barbell training. Mm. So um, I want to refer you guys, and I'll link it in the show notes, to our pain and injury series. But um, but I'm going to kind of lay out my understanding of addressing – pro. like I will send mm-hmm. – if I can't address it this way with my clients, then I send them to Brie. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do first is I'll get a sense of when are the symptoms occurring, with which lifts, with what intensities, with what volume, to see if it's an intensity-related thing, if it's a fatigue-related thing, if it's a lift-related, which can also be like, is it gravity? Is it in these, you know, some people experience... Form, positioning. Yeah, you know, some people experience prolapse in the overhead press, you know, and you wouldn't think that because it's Mm -hmm. an upper body lift, but because they're standing and applying, they're pushing against the bar overhead and their body's in this um, gravity-influenced position, 
um, they can experience prolapse or incontinence, which is people don't even think that they would get mm-hmm. symptoms in that because it's not a lower body lift. But um, so what exercise is it happening with? And is it happening with or without the belt? Um, is it mm-hmm. happening at the end of a training block when fatigue accumulation is high? Is it happening with light, light weights, like warm up weights and that kind of stuff? And, you know, we'll find where the symptoms aren't present and we'll build up from there very slowly and in terms of whatever it is and we'll look at technical issues is the spine changing while they're moving are they you know not addressing their pelvic floor uh, their pelvic position correctly are they how are they bracing like we do all these things and if mm-hmm. the per- if we have been unable to resolve those symptoms and build back up from a, a symptomless p- point um, just at the that threshold of where symptoms begin then I send over to you for um, a little bit more deeper dive into the inner mm-hmm. core and stuff like that. So, you know, I, for and me, too, well, and too, I was going to say if uh, uh, often too, if someone just had surgery mm-hmm. or if someone just had a, a baby, mm-hmm. that's also, cause again, right. remember we talked about yes. those other disruptions or mm-hmm. further disrupting the system. Mm-hmm you typically do need to have yes, somewhat of a dressing of that system. Yeah. So that's common So if too. someone is, exactly, if someone is postpartum, if mm-hmm. they are post-abdominal or pelvic yes. surgery, if they are post-hip surgery, you know, we will, or shoulder surgery even, you know, we work on the stability and foundation part first mm-hmm. um, or with, along with. Yes. Um, and and work at much later intensities during that that time but i from my perspective from being a coach and an orthopedic sports physical therapist i'll problem solve from the outside in and if i get to the inside if if i end up getting to that layer where it's beyond just addressing all of those things that's when i say let's go to brie Mm -hmm. right so if you're a coach or a physical therapist make those or make work from the outside in if there's mm-hmm. no symptoms outside of training and if their symptoms are really only with training but if their symptoms are outside of training then i would say send to pelvic health physical therapy first um but does that sound good to you does that sound like a good yeah. plan of attack <laughs> um so also if you are a clinician or a coach and you have started to problem solve or you're not sure where to problem solve or you're at a you know at a point where you're like ooh, where do i go from here and you need mentorship on this, or you need um, a little assistance problem solving, we do have our Clinical Barbell Institute um, where we provide mentorship mentorship and consultation with that as well. So yeah, so we do offer, so just for people who are interested in that, we'll put the link to that in our show notes, but we, you can, we have some free accessibility to that. We do a literature review every month and a case study presentation. It's not only related to pelvic floor, it's all related or pelvic health. It's related to all things, pain, injury, um, barbell training and coaching related and Mm -hmm. physical therapy related as well. So we integrate all of that stuff for either anyone can join this mentorship program it's um for the athlete who wants to learn this stuff um it's for the coach who wants to also have a really good understanding of this stuff and it's for the clinician who wants to integrate this stuff into their rehab practice so if that's something that you're interested in it's a monthly mentorship program it's not super expensive we do a case study a literature review we have office hours we have access to our entire archive of every presentation every business template every everything that we've ever done in there you have access to so it's this huge archive um the literature review and the case study are free every month so if you're on our newsletter um you'll get an invitation to that every single month so if you just want the free stuff um you can join our newsletter with the link in our show notes but if you want the mentorship component um and you want access to the replays for anything that you can't attend live um then then the men- the mentorship program is is what you're going to want to join so 
this is not like we're we didn't go into this podcast episode and t- we don't really advertise the mentorship program we just have it for people who reach out to us so feel free the link is in our show notes um if you really do want help with this we've got the office hours um and that's kind of where people come to talk to us one-on-one um, um and get the help they can bring their complex cases and all that kind of stuff we can help you there but we have tons of lectures related to everything that we've talked about on the podcast it's all in um in the clinical barbell coaching mentorship program basically like the curriculum on our podcast is expanded upon every month in our mentorship program so if you like the podcast and you want to go deeper and join us for that and have access to us you can go into the clinical barbell coaching program um the mentorship program and have access to us more in depth so anyway Mm -hmm. let's get back to um uh let's just quickly talk about belt use when someone has prolapse yeah so of course and i you have a episode (laughs) on belts and equipment and and, and, salva (laughs) yes so refer back to that because these same concepts um definitely apply to this case um or these types of symptoms or diagnosis um but whenever we specifically are looking at equipment and is is the equipment a part causing a part of the problem or is part of the problem or causing the symptoms. Um, that's something that we want to look at, you know, problem solve with what size belt do you have? How, what is the, the clasp? How are we, or the closure system? How, you know, what lifts are you using it with? Are you, Mm -hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera. What size is it? Yeah. Cause so many thickness. Yeah. Yeah. And with, I mean, like that's, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's just crazy how many little things were you like you opened my eyes whenever uh when we presented at CSF I was like you had all your belts I'm like I know oh I brought God. all my belts to that presentation yeah. that was a that was a heavy suitcase <laughs> yeah <laughs> big old big old uh kitchen uh, bag or carry yeah. on um but in a general sense remember the belt is meant to enhance the appropriate Valsalva brace intercourse what is John John coins the term in our in our belt podcast episode it's the valsalva enhancer yes yes the (laughs) valsalva enhancer and that truly is that's the purpose of the belt so truthfully this shouldn't be a component that's making your symptoms worse however if the fit is not right or you're not valsalvaing correctly we might want to eliminate the belt for a period of time or we want to might want to change what type of belt you're Mm -hmm, using mm -hmm. to better support Mm -hmm. your again, your system. And Mm -hmm. here's the thing too, is we talk about this with, um, positioning and optimal movement and our form is depending on that, either your form can be causing the belt to like encroach on and push Mm -hmm. on the bladder or the, or the belt can be causing you to change your position because it's not comfortable. So we problem Mm -hmm. solve with that Mm -hmm. sense too, Mm -hmm. but yeah, uh, in in a general sense, yes, you'd want to be wearing your belt if, you know, and it should be helping this. Yeah. And I think, so some things with, just to kind of dive a little bit into, to more specifics on belts than related to prolapse and incontinence than we talk about in the belt episode, um, which I'll link in the show notes. Um, so interestingly, when we're, when we're kind of problem solving around the belt, we definitely want to make sure that you have the right thickness and the right width and that the belt is tight enough but not too tight so sometimes Mm -hmm. you know if it's too tight then it can you know really put too much pressure and it can cause things to push down and prolapse Mm -hmm. right um but if it's too loose then it can move while you're lifting and that movement you know we talk about change in position under moving load it's not just your body it's if your belt is also changing position under moving load then that's going to change the position of your skin your muscles your your belly where like pressure's push pressure everything. exactly it's going to change pressure which pressure changing under moving load is going to change everything else in the system right so um if it's too loose or it's too tight that can cause a problem that way but you you talked you mentioned briefly closure um so for people who experience incontinence or prolapse the having a little bit more bulk in the front uh, can call just because it's just more stuff there mm-hmm. when you do come into more hip flexion, um, tr- you know, the, the approximation of the trunk and the, uh, the femurs or the thighs, that bulk of a prong belt 
can be too much. Um, and it's not that the belt is doing anything wrong. It's just that it's just too bulky in front. Mm -hmm. So we can do one of three things. If you're using a double prong belt, you can switch to a single prong belt. That might make a di that might make enough of a difference. Mm -hmm. um, if you're using a I guess, you know, if, I guess we can say if you're using a four inch, 13 millimeter belt, then go down to a three inch, 10 millimeter belt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, we want to make sure that all those things are checked off before we make this, this clasp or closure change. So t uh, double to a single prong or a single prong to a lever. Mm -hmm. And I don't usually recommend a lever, but in the sense of prolapse and incontinence related to bulk of and this is why it's so, it's such a detective process figuring out. It depends. <laughs> how the, if it is, if your prolapse is symptomatic related to bulk in the front of your belly when you lift related to your belt, then we're going to say, let's try a lever belt because it's much flatter and there's less mm -hmm. stuff there. Um, you can also, if you can't get a lever belt, you can move the closure mm -hmm. to the side um, or to the back. So mm -hmm. some people will actually buckle their belt on the back side of their body or on the side so that that's not in front and then pushing down on them. Um, so uh, <clears throat> I didn't use to recommend a lever belt a lot, um, only in situations like that because it is challenging or was challenging to change the lever. You know, sometimes like from lift to lift, we need different whole, we need a different size tightness in our belt. Um, or on different days, like if we go up five pounds or down five pounds or we didn't poop that morning, mm -hmm. or we, you know, we're training in the morning when we've only had one meal versus we're training in the evening when we've had two meals and a snack, you know, um, your waist size might change. But there have, uh, I believe Pioneer um, has come out with a, a lever belt that you don't have to use a screwdriver to adjust. So now it's a little bit easier to use a lever belt and adjust it from lift to lift and day to day. So definitely if, and it depends, it there are so time. many <laughs> reasons why you could be experiencing prolapse, but if it's related to too much sh shit in the front yeah. of your body when you're lifting, um, you might want to move. And, and listen, it can even be like, you know, if you do have more abdominal or central adiposity and your belt can, you know, create too much, you know, you might want to just move it over to the side and see if that um, makes a little bit of a difference. Um, so anyway, Anyways. <laughs> I think we have come to the end of this episode. I mean, we could just keep talking. So I'm just going to end us here for this prolapse episode. We covered so much. We covered different types of prolapse, what they are, men versus women, vaginal versus rectal. Um, we talked about the different... Thongs versus... Th 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 floss thong versus ruler thickness thong. <laughs> like, who knows? We talked we got about... it all covered Yeah, here. we shared our personal experiences with vaginal and rectal prolapse. Um, we've just, you know, uh, talked about... Um, different types of treatment for prolapse in men and women and why prolapse in men might be going misdiagnosed as ED um, or or prostate enlargement. Um, we've talked about then how we can manage training-related prolapse versus when to see a physical therapist therapists if it is training or outside of training as well. Um, and we've talked about... Um, belts related to prolapse so with all that said Brie Ooh. I I love it that was a hell of an episode and um if you need help you know normally at the end of these episodes I call out to join our free Facebook group but um for form checks and you know questions mm -hmm. but I think that pelvic related symptoms or p women and private part related <laughs> issues related to training just book a free consultation with us um it, it can be a little bit personal you know we've shared our very personal and mm -hmm. it can be embarrassing you know um so just book a free consultation you don't have to join yeah. our facebook group it's great to join our facebook group anyway um but, but you don't have to tell us you, you know don't have hey, to like my... dive into your <laughs> prolapse and my butt problems or my vagina right. problems <laughs> <laughs> just book a free consultation with us um we will 
guide you on the appropriate way to begin working on your symptoms, whether that's going to your doctor, um, going to a physical therapist in person, or doing some rehab coaching with Bree or myself. So yeah, with that all said, coaching. every single one of the things that we mentioned in this podcast episode will be linked in the show notes, including the free call and the Clinical Barbell Coaching Institute, and more to come on pelvic health related to be continued the barbell training or whatever yeah. all right guys thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time bye for now